My name is Maria Varela, and I was a MacArthur Fellow class of 1990. The photographs you are about to see is work that I did as a staff member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, I actually never picked up a camera until 1965, which is two years into my tour of duty with, with SNCC. Um, I did it for practical purposes of doing adult basic education and communication materials, but got caught up in the events as communities asked any of us who were on the staff of the SNCC photo department to come into their communities and record events that were going on. So let me start with one of my first images in 1965. This is the way it was in Mississippi in the winter. And in that winter of 1965, this really reflected our own depression at feeling that we failed at getting the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party seated at the 1964 Democratic Party Convention. Um, so this is what I wrote to, to illustrate this image. It was the winter of evictions of striking field workers, of old people freezing to death under damp flour sack sheets, of the Klan still celebrating the murders of the three, Goodman, Cheney, Schwerner. We came back from Atlantic City crowned in our powerlessness to start all over again on lonely plantation roads. And that same winter, homeless plantation workers who had been evicted because of wanting to register to vote um, asked the United States Air Force if they could use their Air Force base in Greenville, Mississippi, which had been empty for 15 years. Could they use it for shelter for the winter until they found other places? With no answers after six months of trying, they went anyway and got into the barracks and were about to set up housekeeping when all of a sudden the Air Force showed up and promptly evicted them. So you see here that eviction action and it prompted me because I was so angry about it to write that this same year the U.S. Army in Vietnam was evicting people from their villages so they could search for Viet Cong stashes of weapons and burn their villages down. So the same action was happening in Mississippi. So it was back to the organizing uh, strategies that was really what SNCC was all about. Here we see, this is a campaign poster. People worked with what they had. Uh, this is a campaign poster for an African-American man running for sheriff in Holmes County, I believe. This was Holmes County's Freedom Democratic Party headquarters. Um, so people worked with what they had. But you know, people often think of the movement as protests and uh, strikes and things like that. But really, that was 15% of what was done when we worked in the Black Belt South. It was about organizing. So here you see the strategizing that went out. If you note the map in the background, looking at what had to be done in different precincts. And youth were always involved and always anxious to be involved because they were treated like young adults, not children, and were given important things to do. This to me is really typical of when you see a SNCC staff person. This one happened to be Stokely Carmichael. Stokely's on a march, but he never Marches were never to him about marches. They were about organizing. So he'd go off to the side of the road, talk to people about registering to vote, get their names and addresses, and said somebody would follow up later and talk to them about um, getting involved in the voter registration movement. Stokely did this on the march from Selma to Montgomery. He walked the whole side of the road, all through Lowndes County, getting names, talking to people about getting involved in voter registration, and this was the result a year later where a 
A third party, which was legal under Alabama law, was established, and they held their first primary. And you can see basically that all the work that was done in the movement involved local leaders, local people, who if it weren't for them, the movement would not have moved. They called themselves the Lowndes County uh, Freedom Organization, but their nickname was the Lowndes County Black Panther Party. And they chose that because of their sense of how the Black Panther defends itself. A lot of people think the Black Panther Party started up in the Bay Area. It did not. It started in Lowndes County, Alabama. And when Stokely was approached by the people in the Bay Area about can we use uh, the Black Panther icon and Black Panther name, he said, you have to ask the folks down in Lowndes County, which they did. They called up Mr. Hewlett, asked for permission, he gave it, and that's how the Black Panther Party uh, got established in the Bay Area. But it wasn't all organizing. It was also sort of getting to know folks and getting to know the kind of local culture. This is Pap Hamer. His name is Perry Hamer. He was Fannie Lou Hamer's husband. She called him her rock. You'd never see him at a meeting or a demonstration or anything that Mrs. Hamer would have been involved with. He was there taking care of the home fires and the family. So I found him in the backyard. They had just butchered a pig that day, and he was uh, cooking what is called cracklins in the south and what we call chicharrones here in the southwest and west. Um, so we started talking about similarities in food, and I was comparing cracklins to chicharrones, which my dad just loved, cornbread to corn tortillas, black eyed peas to pinto beans, and Tabasco to salsa, not exactly, but close. Um, and eight, and I just felt this is an age-old bridge across cultural divides because he was, he was uncomfortable um, with strangers. But this talk about food kind of got him to relax a little enough to give me permission to take his picture. The children were really special. Um, wherever I was, whatever I was involved with with my camera, I always ended up shooting the kids. Uh, these particular kids, <clears throat> um, they were just full of questions. What was I doing? Where was I from? Was I a freedom rider? And they just kept on questioning. And they, they live where they live, you can see, with, their, with life right up in front on their faces. SNCC was responsible for the freedom schools with, upon which the Head Start program was founded. And so this is... This is uh, the first head start in Indianola, Mississippi, which was in an old church. It was cold, and people had to bundle up and have, there was plenty of runny noses and cold hands, but yet these kids hardly missed a day. They loved school, and that was at least those who had shoes. Some kids would actually, some families, one child would get shoes one day and could go to school, and then the next day the child who couldn't go to school got the shoes and could go to school. So it was, um, there was just this drive for, especially among the kids, to try these new things. This is a program that, that Doris Derby, who uh, was a cultural worker for SNCC, started, and that was going to different head starts and talking about Africa. Because kids in Mississippi and throughout the South felt like Africa, there's some, well, they knew Africa through Tarzan, but <laughs> they didn't, you know, their sense of Africa was that there was something wrong with it. And she just did a lot of work with uh, folk stories, artwork, African dress. She showed them how, you know, traditional African dress. And the kids were pretty much just, they, they just loved what she was doing. This is one of my favorite uh, images where you see this was the Meredith March Against Fear. The kids were marching. They were unconcerned about the state police sharpshooter in the back. And I titled this, They Marched Against Fear, led by peers more than parents. They would be the next us. This is true often of the children that I took pictures of, that they came up, they took up the mantle for the next generation to keep on working in Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, uh, to bring justice in their communities. 
So one of the purposes of SNCC photo was to be on marches because they felt that extra eyes might, might keep law enforcement from beating on people uh, if they felt they needed to. Um, but, you know, by 1966, we were really done with marches. And that's reflected in this poem where I say, you know, we marched through the Valley of Dread, reflections in two centuries of tears, not knowing where we would sleep or if morning would come, not knowing would it do any good. This march, the Meredith March Against Fear, came under a different mantra. Um, it wasn't we shall overcome, it was black power. This brought out a whole bunch of new people into the streets that felt before they couldn't join these protests under the rubric of nonviolence, not because they wanted to do violence, but because they just felt if somebody attacked them, they'd probably fight back. Um, so we saw a whole different kind of participants. Uh, this is June Johnson, and uh, she was a young SNCC worker. This is the first Black Panther t-shirt. Uh, we're pretty sure because the Black Panther Party was just emerging in Lowndes County. It wasn't yet in the Bay Area. So because word of mouth, there was no internet, word of mouth was the fastest thing across the Black Belt South that crossed over from Alabama into Mississippi. And here we see this hand-drawn uh, t-shirt. And you can see from the expressions on the people in the back, they were marching under black power. This photograph is something that mainstream media was never interested in. It, and <laughs> because they always felt like the marches and the protests were all of these kind of uh, upbeat uh, things. But here you see, and I call this burdens of resistance, because by this time, this was oh, a couple, several weeks into the march. People were tired. There were things happening along the march route that had people upset. You see Dr. King really um, in a meditative pose, looking burdened down, as, do you, as is Stokely Carmichael, to his right. Um, the same thing for John Lewis, who was the chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. This was an especially hard time for him, as he felt that he distinguished himself from the, so, the whole black power concept. Um, so from here, I went to New Mexico at the invitation of Reyes Lopez de Herina. I did that because when I worked in the South, I noticed that the farmers or people who had land, they were usually first to begin organizing because they had their land. They didn't depend on white people for a whole lot. They did depend on for some things, but it's not like people who didn't have land and who needed uh, to have their jobs with white folks. So Reyes Lopez de Herida was the head of the land grant movement in New Mexico and invited me to come and join him. And I felt, you know, that's where we need to be. We need to look at keeping the land base across this country of indigenous people, of African American people, of Latino people, because we're to, we're, we will be renters in our own land if we don't keep our traditional land. So this is the Poor People's Campaign in 1968. Dr. King invited Reyes and other Latino groups to join him in Washington, D.C. before he was assassinated. After he was assassinated, his organization decided to keep on because this is Dr. King's dream to bring people of color together uh, and to form alliances. Here's Reyes with Corky Gonzalez in the background coming to the Mexican consulate to say to them, you signed a treaty, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which protected our people's land, but you've never enforced it in the world court and our lands were taken. So Reyes joined the Poor People's Campaign because he wanted to bring the land grant movement to the national stage so it would be seen more nationally as an important issue. And there were several people, some people who had never been on an airplane, 
who came to, or a bus actually, and who came to D.C. I think we were there for four weeks. And we did our own marches because uh, we didn't find people in charge of the Poor People's Campaign necessarily responsive uh, to either our issues or to Native American issues. And so we created our own um, strategies to bring our issues before people in the government. In this image, we can see the Brown Berets were ready to march to the U.S. Justice Department to protest police brutality, and they got interdicted by D.C. cops and the uh, park police. I really wish I could have gotten more of an expression on the gentleman who's beating on that young man, but he so frightened me because he had this look of rage and fear that just was... Uh, terrorizing. The Chicano uh, delegation was really instrumental in helping the Native American folks come to the fore because they, they dropped between the cracks. When they got to D.C., they were never invited to the sort of main organizing meetings, and so we worked with them uh, on their issues. Here you see uh, Corky Gonzalez with uh, Gerald Wilkinson and uh, other people, other indigenous people, um, bringing the cause of Native people before the Department of Justice. So we were building alliances as we went along with other organizations nationally uh, around the issues that Chicanos in the Southwest faced. Here you see the Puerto Ricans were so good at this. They decided people had enough talking and enough protesting at different buildings, let's throw a fiesta, and they threw a great fiesta with wonderful food and music. And here you see uh, Reyes Tijerina to the left, Reverend Ralph Abernathy, who took over from Dr. King after he was assassinated, and Helena Valentin, a, a, a longtime civil rights or uh, activist for the Puerto Rican community, together at this fiesta. In the next slide, you see people who never actually would have ever gotten a chance to meet each other. Uh, Black Berets, Brown Berets, and the Young Lords. And they always formed security for all the, the leaders of the different um, cultures that were there. But they also sort of um, developed really good relationships between them. But this is my favorite illustration of <laughs> building alliances. Because after all, you know, all movement building and all uh, developing relationships between people, it is about building relationships. And you see, I really overlooked this image for such a long time. And then when I looked at it more closely, you could see in different parts, people who were getting together um, and sharing stories and lives and, and whatever, it, it, it really reflected to me uh, one of the wonderful outcomes of the Poor People's Campaign. And finally, this is when we all joined together because two weeks before the Poor People's Campaign, Robert Kennedy had been assassinated and was buried up at Arlington. And people felt, uh, there are many groups that felt a big connection, a deep connection with Robert Kennedy, and so the group, the organizations made the decision, we're going to go to Arlington and honor him where he is buried. And that's how we, we finished up the Poor People's Campaign. Reflecting on these images makes me realize that um, they're not old, they're not vintage. Uh, yeah, some of them are 60 years old but we're facing so many of these same things today. Um, we face the critical need to build bridges between the different uh, races and cultures in our country because we are under assault in so many ways, starting with voting, which was a centerpiece of our work in SNCC, um, and ending with all kinds of programs for communities to take their own power and create a different life. So, unfortunately, some of these issues that these images addressed are with us today, and they're going to be with us tomorrow. And so, I think for future generations, we need to understand that our power is in learning each other's histories, 
and our power is in organizing, getting off the streets, getting into the communities, and finding out what people need and what they want to make their life better.